This is the Imagine That with Robin Ritchie podcast. I'm Robin Ritchie. Tonight, it gives me great pleasure to present a legendary musician, singer, and songwriter, none other than the incomparable First Lady of Sal Soul, Ms. Carol Williams. Hi. How are you doing? Hello, how are you? I'm having a great time because I'm on your podcast. Thank you so very much. It's an honor. It's an honor to have you. Thank you. And you look fabulous as always. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. I would love, I, I know a bit of the backstory, but for the sake of the viewers who might not, Would you tell us a little bit about your origins, where you're originally from? I'm from New Jersey. I'm a Jersey girl. And I'm from Montclair, New Jersey, which is a very small, kind of small town. And um, I grew up there, um, had a wonderful um, childhood there and uh, loved uh, the people there and everything. I went to high school there and also... My oldest son went to, graduated from the same high school that I did, Mark Fair High. Yep. Fabulous. So I, 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 it was a wonderful place to live. I love Montclair, culturally rich town, Montclair. Yes, yes, yes a lot, a lot. Um, artists and uh, a lot happening, a lot happening in uh, northern New Jersey area. So, one of the things that I wanted to ask you as a singer and songwriter, is that something you always wanted to do? Since I was nine years old and my father took me, when well, my father used to take me on Sundays to outings, it was like just a daughter and, 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 and a father day. And um, he would take me fishing, crabbing, horseback riding, and I told him, I said, I would like to do something else. So I, I said, Daddy, do you wish that I was a boy? <laughs> because he had me doing all of the things that I liked it, but it wasn't really me until he took me to the Apollo. And I saw the Apollo and that was it. I knew right then and there what I wanted to do with my life. And Fantastic. that's when it started. It, it, yes, I said, you don't have to, you can take me to the Apollo every Sunday, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> But so, yeah, that's when I really, really, I saw the lights and the, the, the um, musicians and the singers, and I was just fascinated. So that's yes. when I realized that's what I'm going to do. That's magnificent. So here we are, this legacy that yes. has carried you across the globe and then some. You I know- promised my mom that I would um, finish high school uh, she mm-hmm. wanted me to go on to uh, college to, um, you know, even if I would have majored in music, but I, I said, oh, no, I don't have time for that. I have to be out here and I have to I have to be singing and playing at places and everything. I, I, I cannot go to college and do that. So I left at, at, within about a month after graduating from high school. That's when I decided to um, move to Brooklyn and pursue the singing. And that's what I did. Was there resistance from your family initially? Yes. Yeah, they didn't. They didn't like it at all. They didn't want to um, have me, uh, you know, they wanted me to go to college. And uh, it was just something that I felt that, no, I, I, I have to do this now. I don't have time to go to college and learn, what, I, I just want to do it now. So we had some, re- yes, definitely. And um, it it was hard at first because I really didn't have my parents, uh, you know, helping me or encouraging me to do what I was gonna do. But um, I think in the long run, I'll never forget when more came out, my mother and father, um, they were going to Puerto Rico for vacation. And my mom called me, we didn't have cell phones or anything. So she had called me from my house phone and she said oh my god they're playing your record at the airport and then then I knew I had approval 
<laughs> yes, yes. Yes. That's was, magnificent. Yes, and it was fun. Are you an only child? Yes, I am an only child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So am I. When you relocated to Brooklyn from Montclair, mm -hmm. where did the Geminis come into? What well, I, I I saw that you had joined a group, Comico. Is that how that was pronounced? Um, I was with Comico. I was with the Geminis. I also was with a group called the Pennies when I when I was still at home, and um, doing some gigs and things from. Um, living with my mother and father that I had uh, also recorded and uh, did something with the girls group by the name of the Pennies. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't meet the uh, Geminis until I had moved to Brooklyn. And I happened to meet um, one of the uh, guys that uh, plays in the Flamingos. He was the uh, saxophone player. Really? And uh, he introduced me to his wife which her name was Barbara, and she also was a Gemini. And then her sister, at that time, her sister was only 16 years old, but we ended up having a, um, we had a group and we made, our names were the Geminis because Barbara and I were Geminis. Our, our, our sign was Geminis and, and Fippi was a, a Libra. So we ended up calling the name of the group the Geminis. I see. I see. How long were you with them? I was with them for a while because we uh, went um, and did a USO tour. Uh, we were gone for about three months. And uh, when we came back, we met Eddie OJ. And at that time, Eddie OJ was uh, managing the OJs. So uh, he put us into the Apollo without having a record out or a record company or anything. And we were there three times. We were there first with Chuck Jackson. And then the second time we were with, uh, with um, oh, the a guy that sings Sitting in the Park. Uh, oh, I can't Billy Stewart? This. Yes, yes, Billy Stewart. And then the last time we were there, I think it was with Yvonne Fair. And How on earth did you go from the Geminis? You know, I in, in the research, I found so many fascinating things. Uh, I learned that more was a remake. Yes. Right. Coming from a film, uh, what you just shared about the OJs. That's phenomenal. How yes. do you go from not having... A record even? No, I'm telling you, we had no record. We had no record. We weren't signed with RCA yet. And I remember that we were doing, because we had no record, we were doing um, Come See About Me by the Supremes. We were doing things by Le Le um, Levi Stubbs. We had no songs to identify for ourselves. So we were doing other people's songs. And I remember Le 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 Levi Stubbs, uh, we were singing uh, Sugar Pie Honey Bunch. And he had came to the Apollo and he saw it and he said, you, you all are not doing it right. You're not doing it right. And he came up to our room, which you had rooms when you were in Apollo. You were there like at 8.30 in the morning because your first show was like 10 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So he came and he saw us and he said, no, you're not doing it right. Let me, you know, so he was wonderful. He came into our dressing room and he got it straight. This is how you do it. This is, this goes here and everything. And we, we were just, uh, we were just so surprised to have him, you know, to have him there and uh, teach us the right way that we should be singing it. <laughs> right. Right. It was amazing. I, 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 and, and were you cognizant of the full legend and the advantage that was unusual of having that sort of hands-on instruction by someone who was world renowned and legendary you know when you're that young you just 
I don't know. You, you, you're surprised at it, of course. Yes, you're really surprised that, you know, this that, that a person has that kind of pull that can just do that, you know? And, um, and we just enjoyed so many things. I remember um, someone, when, when you were like the opening act or like the first or second act, the way the Apollo is, is that there's rooms and there's beds and stuff that you stay in. And um, so if you're like one of the first acts, you're all the way up to the top of the, uh, of the dressing room. So we would be like on the, 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 the eighth or ninth floor and then they have a speaker and everything that says Gemini's to the stage and you'd have to run down all those stairs to get on uh, to be ready to go on stage and that's like at 10 o'clock in the morning and then you had four or five shows a day I mean it was a wonderful experience being that we really hadn't had all that experience with not having a record out or anything you know so Right. I have never been to the Apollo as Carol Williams mm -hmm. after I had um, more out and my album with the Salsa Orchestra, but I have been at the Apollo with the, our names, the Geminis on the marquee. I have pictures of it and uh, it's just amazing. I've, I've, I've been there as the Geminis, but never as Carol Williams, the singer with the Salsa Orchestra. Uh, uh, you know, just to have landed there and have mm -hmm. that experience um, to have been so young. And Basically, we were amateurs because we had no record out, but we were there as as with our names on, on, on the um, marquee. Three right. times, three times being there, yes. Amazing. And, and and you look back and you said, my goodness, you know, that is just amazing how we were able to uh, pull that off. <laughs> sure, sure. We I'm were sure. lucky. Sure. What happened with the Geminis? Uh, we ended up getting a record deal with RCA. Mm -hmm. And I'll mm -hmm. never forget, it was just wonderful because one of the, we had about uh, four or five songs that we had out. But one of the songs that um, we also had a pleasure of doing was Valerie Simpson and Ashford. Ashford and Simpson came in and they wrote a song called I Hired the I, I Hired the Guy for the FBI. And also I think we did, a friend of mine told me two songs and they were right there in the studio with us when we were um, recording and it was just amazing. It really was. We were recording with, you know, a live, a live orchestra. Um, one of the first songs that we had out was um, Get It On Home and No More Tomorrows. And it was a slow song. Mm -hmm. And I remember being in the booth and because uh, I was the lead singer. And I would remember being in the booth and this whole orchestra was just on the side of me. Uh, the strings, the horns, actually more people for that session than actually the salsa orchestra because when I did the things with the salsa orchestra, they came in the rhythm section first and then after the rhythm section was done, then the horns would come in in the string. So it wasn't everybody all at one time, right. but with the Geminis, it was everybody, the strings, the horns, the um, rhythm section and a conductor conducting, taking a stick, let me know it's time for me to sing and just actually just recording everything at, together, the whole orchestra at one time with background singers and everything all at one time. It's And then to be with the Salsa Orchestra and, and just have like Earl Young and, and Norman Harris in the rhythm section and the keyboard and the bass. It was that I was there for every one of my sessions with the Salsa Orchestra when they put down everything before I even sang. So it was it was like, oh, this is so different from when I was with RCA. Sure. And um, you know, we would actually do it all together. The singers, the orchestra, everything all together. And speaking of Sal Soul, how did we land with Sal Soul? <sighs> Let me tell you, my uh husband was the uh musical director for Wilson Pickett. 
And Wilson Pickett had, you know, a lot of hits out and everything. And he was traveling around with him and everything. And Wilson Pickett had a, a, a road manager. Her name was Lee Waite. And I knew Lee, you know, I knew Lee from Lee Wade from, you know, coming and seeing my husband play with uh, Wilson. So I got to know her very well. So at the time, um, I was singing with a, um, a, a, four, a top 40 band. Uh, they were called Vackies. And we were all over in Jersey. We did the Mamata Inns. We did all the hotels and everything like that. And I was working um, six nights a week. And uh, I would drive all the way from New York to Jersey to do these things that we were doing. And we were down in uh, South Jersey and I got a call from Lee Wade and she said, they're holding auditions for, they're looking for like a disco singer, similar to like Gloria Gaynor. And um, the audition is gonna be up in um, the city. So uh, anyway, we arranged for it and everything. And uh, I took my husband with me when I uh, went to the audition and it was like a lot of girls there. And they gave us sheet music and they expected you to uh, sight read. Mm. I don't sight read, mm. but I had my husband there. So he was able to sight read it and, you know, put it in my ear, have the song with. Excellent. And the song was Rattlesnake, which is on my, uh, the, the uh, album of uh, with the Salsa Orchestra, but that song wasn't the Al Salsa Orchestra playing at the book. But anyway, they were looking for somebody to do this song. And I did the song. And I kind of, Gloria Gain is a very good friend of mine. So when they said that they wanted someone to sing it, uh, similar to like how Gloria Gaynor sang her songs and everything, don't forget, I'm, I'm a top 40 singer at this time. So I'm yes. doing everybody's song when I'm singing five nights a week, six nights a week with the uh, Back East band. So um, it was easy for me to say, okay, let me try to sing it kind of like how Gloria would sing it. And I think that's how I got it. And when I got that, uh, they uh, wanted to come and see me with my band because I, I, I had, my husband was also my band leader and I had a band and I was performing around and stuff with them, even though I still was with the top 40 people. So when they came to see me, and of course I tried to do the songs that I knew that um, that that the, the the people were doing at Sigma Sound at the time. Mm -hmm. So, because I'm top forty, so we did it, and we they were ready to almost sign my band. That's how good that the band sounded in our whole situation that we had. They were ready to almost just sign my whole band with me. So that's how I got signed with Salsa. Fantastic, fantastic. And then, the, and then it's ironic because my first producer wasn't supposed to be Vince Montana. It was supposed to be Floyd, Lolita Holloway's husband. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had did some things on uh, Lolita before she was signed. She was signed to Goldmine, which is a part of Salsa. But my when they were going to do the album with me, they decided that they want to put me with uh, Floyd. And Lolita and Floyd at the time, they lived in Chicago. And Lolita hated to fly. They both did not like to fly. So most of the time when they came in to, um, to New York and everything, they, were, they would drive in. So um, we, were, we, we were waiting. I was waiting to get with Floyd, you know, so we could pick the songs that we were going to do. And... And it just took, it was forever because he wasn't, he, he, he wouldn't fly and he wasn't coming in at any time soon. So we decided, Salso decided to put me with Vince Mantan. That's mm. when I got, as I said, okay, you're going to be with Vince. Uh, and Vince lived in Cherry Hill, which wasn't mm -hmm. too far. You know, I could, I could drive down to where he was and, uh, he was just wonderful to work with. He had a, a studio, a little studio in the back of uh, his house. And we would go in there and we would try, now, now we got to go through what songs are we going to do? Right. What, you know, um, Vince writes, I wrote. And so I think three of my songs on that uh, album I wrote and Vince and I put it together. I could play it so that he could hear the key and everything. So we got those three songs together, but then we had to figure out what were the other songs. 
So uh, one day I just came up with the idea, you know, Vince, they're doing a lot of standard songs and they're bringing a lot of standard songs into, um, you know, disco, like Glory was doing How High the Moon and uh, all different kind of songs. So right. Right. I came up with the idea, let's take more and let's make it into a disco kind of thing. So that's what we did. And when we actually put that record out, when Salso actually put that first record out, uh, we had to hurry up and get it out because we had found out that there was a, a guy group that also was doing um, the song more and uh, they were doing it like a disco kind of thing. So they had to hurry up and put more out. By that time, we had uh, just about had everything on the album. So we had did, did all of the, uh, the other songs and uh, Bunny Sigler got a song on um, on that album that we did. And um, who else did? Oh, I fell in love with uh, I Lo uh, Love Is You, which was done by another writer. And, um, you know, when Vince and I listened to the things that we were going to put on the album, um, you know, we picked out what it was that we wanted and everything. And so I also had wrote a song called You're So Much a Part of Me that I had wrote with uh, Jack Paracon and because I used to write before I was recording. And so right. we, we were able to use that and Vince loved that song because he he loved the um, the arrangement that he did with the horns coming in the beginning of the song. So yes. it was wonderful working with Vince. He was really wonderful to work with. And Legend. he was, um, he, he, he just had the music down and my reference, uh, I would reference uh, the songs, you know, once he got the music and everything and everything was written, everything was written when the strings and horns came in, it was all, he had scores for it. With the rhythm section, uh, Earl and them did that. So there, there really wasn't too much music. It was more feel and everything. Yes. And Vince uh, would go in and I could see him conducting and oh, he was just great conducting, conducting and everything. And so before the strings and horns had to go on, I had to go in and do my vocals with just the, um, the the uh, the rhythm section so that he could arrange the vocal the the, the strings and horns around what my vocals were doing. Right. So I went in and I did the vocals and um, then he took it and scored everything. And so I'm hearing it for the first time with the strings and the horns and everything on it. Yes. And he did a fantastic job. Absolutely. And I said, well, now that you have the strings and horns on. Vince, do you want me to go in and just do everything all over because now there's a different feel because you can't hear the strings. This is all no, no, no. He was very easy to work with. As far as my vocals, Vince let me do whatever it was that I wanted to do. He really did not um, bother me or stop me or say, do this or do that or do it different. He completely let me be myself on my vocals. And uh, he was one of the best people that I can say as a producer that just let me do me and didn't stop me, never questioned, oh, maybe you should do this. I, I loved working with him. Yes. Magnificent. And this was, you know, as a singer and songwriter and musician and being a woman, this was at a time whereas that wasn't always encouraged because right. of the fact that this is a predominantly male dominated industry yes. on the business yes. end. Yes. And, and so you, how did you find the courage? How did you find the fortitude to move forward with some of the ideals and things that Carol had inside? I think after working with Vince and, um, you know, with the record company and um, we had to fight for some of the songs that we had wrote, uh, that he had wrote and I had wrote to get onto the album because um, they wanted to own the publishing and they, um, you know, I wouldn't let them have any of the writing, but I had to give the publishing at the time. So when I did that, um, I realized that by the time I had left uh, Salso and went to do my next song, uh, my next album, I had complete control. 
Right. I had the control of the how the album was going to look, uh, what I was going to wear for the album. Uh, I wrote every one of the songs on the album, and I gave every one of my musicians a chance if they wanted to write something that they had um, they had uh, the rights to, you know, submit to me what they wanted to write. And my musicians, I had got to the point that these guys had worked with me um, when I did my personal shows and everything. This was my band with my husband being the leader of the band. Uh, and uh, we were called um, the Fantasia. But I said, no, I want to use every one of my musicians that plays on stage with me. I want them to be in the studio and I want them to each have a chance to play behind all of the songs. And that's what we did. We, we rehearsed downstairs here in my basement. So that when we went in to record everything Everybody knew just what they were doing. Right. I did all of my backgrounds myself. I think a couple of the songs I did with um, the drummer who was also a singer. Mm -hmm. So he did all of the backgrounds, some of the backgrounds with me, but the ones that he's not on, that's me doing all of the backgrounds and all the harmonies and everything. I just wanted to be so involved uh, right. where I had um, the choices of what songs I wanted to do and, um, we wrote every one of those songs, and, and the, uh, some of the songs are on there that my musicians wrote also. Yes. So I had a, I really had a chance of just taking complete control over what I wanted to do. And we recorded that, um, the Reflection of Carol Williams album was recorded in Sigma Sound here in New York, not Sigma down in um, Philadelphia where I did the Salsa Orchestra, it was done and uh, in the Sigma Sound here in New York. And it was just, it, 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 you know, I, I think at that time I wore all hats. I was in complete control. Of everything. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You know, you talked a little bit about fashion and making decisions in terms of your look. And you have been a fashion icon. True legends shape fashion, they shape music, they shape concepts, they shape thoughts, they think out of the box, and everything is affected. And that's one of the reasons why you're legendary. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, it, I'm, I'm very, um, I, I'm, I, I would consider I'm very creative when it comes to um, what I the look that I'm looking for or what I'm trying to um, get together. I remember when the Geminis, when we were at the Apollo, well, we didn't have really stage outfits and everything. And we had to, you know, come up with all these different ideas of trying to, you know, look like we were part of what the, the, the music business is about. And yes. I remember that we wore one time we wore, um, from when, when I had gotten married, when my, my wedding, I had the things for the wedding that can come off of the dress. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up using three of those for one of our, uh, one of our things that we wore on stage. And it was, it was amazing, you know, just trying to put, in, put things together. I love um, putting different things and different looks and it, I'm a Gemini. So I don't stick with one particular look, you right. know, and I try to um, just do various things. I also um, love to crochet. So oh. I make hats, baby blankets, dresses, all kind of things. I just saw on Instagram the other day, a, a, a guy crocheted pants and I can't wait to, to try it. It were, it were beautiful, but I'm very creative when it comes to doing things that are, um, you know, with my hands and, and sewing. And also I had a beauty shop at one time. Really? Where, um, I went to beautician school and I got my license and I opened up a beauty shop. And when I opened it up, I had decided that I wanted to really to, um, to cater to people in the industry, people that were uh, entertainers, you know, people that keep that, keep you know, the nails, I was doing right. nails, I was doing hair, I was doing everything. 
So I tried to keep um, a lot of people involved with um, being in the um, music business. Gloria Gaynor used to come to my shop. It was a couple of other people. That, yes, yes, yes. So I've always been um, trying to just love to create. Whether that it's hairstyles or fabulous. makeup or nails. You see my nail? Yes. And I said, I've always, yes, been into that part of the business, which the music business is great because you can wear all that kind of stuff and everything. Certainly, certainly. And I love how you combine textures and textiles yes. and uh, yes. and create different layers and depths. And, yes. and you don't replicate. Try not to, you know, That's it's, the other it depends thing. on my, my moods. Like right now, I love the colors that everybody's wearing, like the lime greens and the hot pinks. And, oh, I just, I love it. I love those things. I'd like to talk to you or I'd, I'd love for you to share with us a little bit about a song that was brought to you by a world-renowned producer, Daryl Payne, mm -hmm. who brought a song to you that you passed on. Uh, he, um, I I'm talking about Over Like a Fat Rack. Oh, I was with... Um... <laughs> oh, what was the name of the company that I was with? That profile, uh, Vanguard. And uh, I think I had already did Can't Get Away. I think I'm not. I'm not really sure what I did. But uh, yeah, he he has. Well, he's the producer. He has ears, so he wanted to let me hear the song over like a fat rat. Now, when I'm hearing it. It's uh, Jocelyn Brown that's singing it. And uh, I think it's just her and a keyboard player. That was really. Great. And um, so so it's nothing like how Fonda did it. I'm not hearing it anything the way Fonda did it. I'm just hearing it before she did anything with it. I'm hearing it the way that Jocelyn and the writer of the song have put it together. So it's just a keyboard and Jocelyn singing it. I uh, listened, I think I only listened like once. I didn't really listen to it too many times because sometimes, you know, you listen and you say, you know, well, let me hear it again, you know, but I didn't get it. I didn't get it when I heard it. I said, no, I don't want to do it. Right. And I said, for one thing, I had hated the fact that I did Rattlesnake with the South, with, well, got me with Salso. I hated that song, Rattlesnake. Mm -hmm. So I had said, I'm not singing anything else about an animal. I don't mm. want to sing anything else about an animal. So I just said, no, the, the, the song is not for me. And then when Fonda came out with it, oh my God, she tore it up. She, yes, that, she did. That, that rendition of how she did it, the way they played the music, the way, oh God, if I had heard it something like that, it would have been a yes. <laughs> but she, that, that, that is her song. She yes. And I would go in a club and say, my God, I can't believe that's the same song that I heard. You know, I loved it. I love that song. Wow. So that's what happened with Over Like a Fat Rat. <laughs> that's amazing. And Fonda Ray is a sweetheart. She's actually, I featured her on the Imagine That with Robin Ritchie podcast Uh a few years ago, perhaps yes. four or five years ago at the Lehman Center for the Arts in the Bronx. Okay. And um, she's yes. an absolute dear. And, you know, it oh, just goes to show what's for you is for you. It's for you, yes. And I mean, she's a terrific uh, songwriter. She writes, uh, you familiar with her song, Hey Oh Bob? I mean, she's she is- she I is love Hey Oh Bob. Yes. And a lot of people yes, aren't is. hip to Hayoba. No, a lot of people don't know that she, you know, she had, did that. But And she's a phenomenal uh, entertainer on stage. I mean, Fonda yes. can 
get down when she's on that stage performing. Yes. She is a phenomenal uh, entertainer. And you just uh, mentioned to me about Lehman College. I have to tell you a little story about Lehman College. Uh, I don't remember um, who booked me, but um, I still had my band, which my husband was the, um, the uh, musical director of my band. So I got booked to open up for James Brown at Lehman College. And wow. that was one of the highlights I can say of my career because um, he was, I, I met him, I went over and uh, said, hi, Mr. Brown. And he takes my hand and says, he calls me ma'am. Hi, how are you doing, ma'am? And it was just like, oh my goodness, James Brown. And uh, that, w that night I really was, I was just, couldn't believe it. And I think I did about, uh, maybe about 40 or 45 minutes of my show before he came out. And um, I, you know, I had, I had great musicians. I really did. And, and, and uh, he also um, commented and said, you know, he loved the way the band played and everything and everything. But Excellent. That was a highlight for me to open up for James Brown. Everybody Amazing. Was, yes. Mm-hmm. Amazing. I'm and surprised also, he didn't try to whisk you off with him <laughs> and take you on tour. <laughs> it, oh, but listen, I, I would have gladly went, that's for sure. And another thing that I want to just uh, tell you that um, was, a, um, was a very good uh, thing that happened in my career was when I opened up at the Newark Symphony Hall in Newark, New Jersey for Ray Charles. And uh, yes, for Rachel, yes. Oh my God, that was wonderful. So we, I've, I've had moments in my life that, you know, have definitely made me feel like I went and picked the right thing. <laughs> That's magnificent. That magnificent. And funny yes. that you mentioned Ray Charles. So I perhaps 15 years ago featured a, a wonderful uh, producer, arranger, and you might very well know her, Reverend Stephanie mm -hmm. Minity, who had uh, Jubilation Choir, which originally began with N.J. Pack. Yes, but I think, the, I, I think, yes, I do know. World-renowned. She has a few Grammys under her belt, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But Nevertheless, 15 years ago, when I had my little engine who could uh, local programming cable television show that aired in all of uh, Newark and all of New York City, mm -hmm. Reverend Minity and a few of the Jubilation Choir members performed, but what they shared and what was unveiled on my show for the very first time was a performance they had did with Ray mm -hmm. Charles oh and God. they were singing Silent Night. It had not been released, it had not been seen. And we showed this footage of them, the entire choir singing behind Ray. Oh, it was, was Mr. Charles, it was. That must have been amazing. It, it, it was, it was. And so that, um, that came to my mind when. Yes, yes. I had, I had to mention that because um, that was, uh, you know, one of the highlights of being with Ray Charles and then being also with um, opening up for James Brown. James Brown. It doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> Your career is outstanding. And the beautiful part about it is particularly when you look at a lot of things that are happening today in 2024. Mm -hmm. Often we see the talent, but the longevity isn't necessarily there. Yes, yes, it, it, you're, it, you're right. No, it's just, um, I see so many different uh, younger um, performers and singers and, you know, they, um, they have videos, they, they look great, they sound great. But it's like, um, when you think about like the Stephanie Mills and uh, the people that have been uh, before us, uh, 
and they're still here today. The Gladys Knight, Mary J. Bly, you know, yes. she's a little uh, younger than them, but it's just that they were just Diana Ross, the Supremes. I mean, that was entertainment. Gloria um, Gaynor. It's just, yes. Yeah, Melba I, Moore is another one. Oh, Melba. These are definitely. iconic. All of you ladies, iconic. Yes, iconic. yes, yes. Um, Frida Payne is still out here doing, uh, you know, just Sherry Payne. I'd love to talk about your status as the first lady of South Soul. Was there ever any competitiveness with some of the other women who came on board after you? No, it ne never, never. Mm -mm. Beautiful. Um, Lolita was on Goldmine, which is a subsidiary of um, South Soul. I think first choice was on gold mine too. And um Ladies of Sky, I think they're on they were they were, they were on South so. Fantastic. So, and I love them. Yeah, uh, no, it's yes. never ever any problem at all. Beautiful, beautiful. And all of you seem to be very, very close today. I've I've seen you uh perform on stage with some of these other artists, as as a matter of fact, uh, artists from the South Soul label. And all of you, it's yes. always like a family reunion. It is, because we had such a great time. Uh, the one time that the South Soul Orchestra actually played, at, I was on the show, Lolita was on the show, Double Exposure, uh, Barbara Vet and Carla, they were the background singers and everything. And they advertised it on television for like years and years. And uh, actually, um, we actually sang with the South Soul Orchestra. And the South Soul Orchestra was anywhere to like 36 to more people because of the strings, the horns, the rhythm section, and everyone. And Roseland, Roseland. Oh, that's okay. where we were. Mm -hmm. And I remember that uh, Vince had all this music that was just wheeled in on, 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 on just stacks and stacks of music because the horns had to have it, the strings had to have the music. And I'll never forget, I, I don't even remember when we had the rehearsal, but I remember we did the show. And uh, to this day, I think they have, uh, you can go on YouTube and you can see uh, the whole advertisement about us being at uh, Roseland for the South Soul uh, show. And it, like I said, it was first choice was on it. I was on it. Lolita was on it. Uh, I think uh, Ladies of Sky might, might have been on it. I'm not sure, but it was just phenomenal. It was really something else. I love when I see it because it just brings us back to how far back and, and how long ago that we had did this, you know, and you see Vince, uh, you know, conducting the, the, the orchestra. And Vince always wanted to have and do something with the Salsa Orchestra. He wanted to do more things, but, you know, to get 36 people, 36 people to 50 people, you know, even if you flew over and everything and the um, string players, they were, they were up in age. So it was almost like an impossibility to try to, you know, do a show like that, you know, yes. which would have been great if we could have done that, you know, definitely, yeah. but uh, it, it didn't happen. But all of those musicians were the same thing. The South Soul Orchestra was the MFSB. Right. They all were the, um, and there was another name too that they had, but they were all part, they were all the same. They were the, the Earl Young on drums, the bass player, uh, Norman Harris on, uh, on the guitar, uh, Bunny Sigler, everybody was, was all part of all of those different bands. Right. And they don't forget, they also played for Patti LaBelle. The, you yes. Know, she recorded, she recorded at Sigma Sound and, um, Gene Karn and a lot of people came out of that uh, Sigma Sound, definitely. 
when I uh, was recording uh, with uh, Vince for the uh, album, I was there every day to see everybody put everything down. And it was just amazing. And at that time, we didn't have our cell phones and the things we have nowadays. I would, right. let me tell you, if I had my phone and everything that I had now, that I have now, I would just have all kind of pictures because I would have been taking pictures of them, you know, just putting everything Chronicling down. Chronicling the you know. journey. Yes. Speaking of which, what do you think of the music today? I like some of it, I, but it just doesn't sound like it's the kind of music that's going to stay around for a long time, or you're going to look back at it like you do when you hear the OJs and Gladys Knight and the Pips and all these different artists that uh, were out. It just doesn't seem like it's remembered. I don't know because it's the younger people too. Um, you know, like Whitney stuff, of course, will always be around because she had such so, so such great songs, you know. But I don't know about some of these uh, songs that the younger girls or the guys have out, if they're going to be around for a long time. Are, are they going to end up being, you know, like uh, favorites of uh, back in the day? which would be back in their day. I don't know. I, I don't hear too many things that right. uh, stand out to me like that. Right, right. One thing that I loved about disco was that it brought people back to dancing together. Yes. It uh, had a disco brought in a lot of people having dance studios and people wanting to learn how to uh, dance to the disco music and it was just uh, it was just fantastic because it just brought people together, right? Um, like you like you know you like like you would see maybe back in the Fred Astaire days, you know, when Ginger Rogers and him would dance and stuff like that. It sure. brought the disco brought people doing routines and dancing together and things like that, and so many shows and everything right. uh, that were um, you know that were out. Uh, sing doing disco. Soul Train, American yes, Bandstand. Yes, American Bandstand and all the other different shows that they had. It just brought people together, right. you know? And, and, and it's funny because, you know, when you still get people together to do a show, everybody is dancing and doing the hustle and, you know, they're doing their thing. And, and people love that because that, that's from their era. That's what they're used to and what they were doing when they were, they were younger. Right. Right. Yeah. So your son, I hear, is also a musician. Yes. Yes. My son so this runs a, in the family. Yes. Well, he, I can, let me tell you a story. Um, uh, we had a rehearsal. We were rehearsing with my husband's uh, band and everything. And I had a drummer. His name was Wally Gator. He is a phenomenal drummer, and uh, everyone knows he's he's worked with uh, Wilson Pickett, he's worked with Lionel Hampton, and he's jazz and everything. And we, I met Wally when he was like only sixteen or seventeen years old. When um, we had uh, when I was with the Gemini's, mm -hmm. and we actually he was just so good at sixteen or seventeen years old that we used to. He was in my band at that time. I hadn't. Um, had the band with um yeah my husband was in the band we put wally in the band and he could sing he was at the he, he brought me on stage he could do everything and he ended up being um the drummer for wilson pickett but um he you know the, the musicianship i i don't know if you ever heard of bernard purdy have you ever heard of the I drummer bernard say. purdy let me tell you about bernard purdy we met him when we were with the Geminis. Yes. And at that time, you know, it was, you had to have a drummer. You had, you know, it was real musicians that came in to do sessions. And when Bernard Purdy was doing a session, you knew he was doing a session because he would have all these signs out saying, hire Bernard Purdy, Purdy's the one. To, oh, it's like, Purdy, what's all these signs and everything going on? 
Anyway, to make a long story short, he's still living today. Oh, beautiful. He is one of the top uh, drummers that goes around and he lectures all in Europe and everything. And he has a son that also is a musician now too. But Bernard Purdy ended up being Aretha Franklin's musical director. Mm -hmm. And he was just on everything and doing everything. And this is a guy that just started out playing drums with his little cracks and things saying, hire Bernard Purdy. And he is phenomenal. Yes. And so I had the, 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 the chance to, you know, see musicians like that uh, uh, do their thing and, 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 and just be just amazing. It was just amazing to see how people really put uh, so much effort into what they really wanted to do. Absolutely. And then I, back in those days, I used to get hired just to do hand claps. We used to have like three or four girls, never mind singing. We just had to do claps and everything. And you got paid to do hand claps because they didn't have the thing that does that now. Nowadays, you can just, in my studio, I can do a whole session of, of, of sounding like it's 50 people and it'll yes. only be one person just doing everything, putting everything together, putting the drums and getting this and getting that and everything. And uh, one another person that I have to give uh, kudos to is um, a jump player. And who influenced I didn't hear you, you most? Who influenced you most musically? Oh, oh yeah, I got to tell you about that. Um, after my father had taken me to the Apollo and I realized that that's what I wanted to do, let me tell you what I, my mo mo mother and dad had, a, they had um, the 78 records. I listened to Dakota Staten. I listened to jazz arts. I listened to Lena Horne. I listened to um, Sarah Vaughn. Uh, all these different people that were singing jazz and that's who I, that's who I listened to. That's what I would play those records over and over and over again. And then by that time I was listening to like Frankie Lyman. Yes. And, uh, you know, the stuff that was being played for up to date with, with me, but my first people that I was influenced by were jazz singers. The scatting, the uh, just, just, just unbelievable. Yes. I remember uh, Edie Gourmet and Steve Lawrence. I like them. Love them. I like Sinatra. I like Sammy Davis Jr. All of that. Doris Day. I liked her for her diction because she could just, every word you could understand exactly what she said. I loved her voice. And that's the, those are the people that I listen to. Beautiful. And you know, that's interesting because as a child growing up in Sugar Hill, Harlem, mm -hmm. which is where I'm originally from, my mom watched all of those people. You see? Yes. And so when I was knee high to a doorknob, mm -hmm. I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to be in the entertainment industry. Yes. And I always say... I learned to host, meaning live events. Yes. I learned from watching the Jerry Lewis telethons. Yes, the people that he used to have on there were phenomenal people. Right, right. Yes. Uh, Lou Rawls, mm -hmm. the uh, yes. Easter Seals annual uh, event that he used to have. Um, so as a child, I watched all of these people and uh, I loved their flair, their quick mm -hmm. wit, and how they combined all of these magnificent talents effortlessly. So pathways that I had yet to reach. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it really means a lot when you have someone who can support you in your dreams. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as we come upon the close of... Uh, this interview and what would you share for 
young hopefuls, what would you share with them who are looking to come into the industry? What jewels or jewel would you give to them and those who are listening? I would give to them because of the the knowledge and uh, the, 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 the way that, you know, because we have uh, Instagram, we have social media, we have so many things that if you really are interested in going to in anything, whether it's entertainment or whatever it is, there's so much knowledge on our phones, uh, to on YouTube, on um, everywhere that you can just go into some of these things and find out if this is what is really your passion. Because I think today in our day and time, the way in the things that we have at our disposal, it's just so much that, you know, people can just go into anything that they want and, and, and search it out and find out about it and see if it's you. The main thing that I think is people need to really know what do you want to do with your life? Where do you want to go with it? Do you want to go into entertainment? Do you want to go, uh, do you want to be a doctor? Do you want to be a lawyer? It's, it's, it's there for the taking. We just have to find out about it and we can have, we can find out more because it's so much, it's just a matter of picking up your phone and, and Googling whatever you want to know. Right. And I think that, that it's, it's, it's so that's a wonderful thing for people to be able to, you know, to really uh, find out what it is that they, that they really want to do, see what it is, check it out and everything. And that's what I would uh, tell anybody that's going into any type of, uh, you know, going into life uh, uh, jobs and anything that you feel that you want to do. There's so many things that, you know, can let you know about it. Right. So educate yourself. Yes, basically. educate yourself. Find right. out as much as you can. If right. this is what I want to do, is this what you want to do? You know, and and go for it. Sure, sure. What's next for you? Um, I have. Uh, I I I think I've got to start writing again. And there's no reason why I shouldn't be. I can usually write pretty good if somebody sends me a track or just sends me um, just the music I can write. Uh, right. I think that if I do uh, my writing, it would be uh, something that, you know, what, what I know about, uh, not necessarily disco, but, you know, to write, you know, a ballad or something like that, mm -hmm. that, um, that really makes me feel like, you know, I, I just want to really do this. This is what I want to write about. Yes. And I think I'm going to, I'm going to start, you know, getting back into my writing. Definitely. Fantastic. Well, Carol Williams, first lady of South Soul, when I tell you what an honor to have you close out Women's History Month on the Imagine That with Robin Ritchie podcast, we featured some phenomenal ladies this year uh, and to close out with someone who I have revered over the years, your style, the music as a dancer, as a choreographer, uh, and it just warms my heart to have had you here on the Imagine That with Robin Ritchie podcast. I'm just so honored. I am so honored to be able to have had this podcast with you. And I have learned a lot from you. And I admire, uh, I admire our Black women that take charge, that know how to do things. You are phenomenal, yes. And I enjoyed being with you. And I've learned a lot from you, from our talks, and the things that we talked about before the podcast. So thank you for having me because I've learned a lot and we will definitely keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, this has been Imagine That with Robin Ritchie. 
the podcast. I am Robin Ritchie, and tonight's guest was world-renowned musician, singer, songwriter, the incomparable first lady of South Soul, none other than Carol Williams. Carol, all the best to you. Same Keep you. rocking. Thank you so much. And you're fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you. So Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you again. And have a wonderful, wonderful time tonight. Yes. Thank you so much. I, I would just like to say that my son is going to be at the casino. And uh, it's at the Resorts Casino here in Queens. And we have a lot of people that are coming down. So I'd like to support him when he's doing his uh, shows and everything. So thank you. So I, so I was able to say that on the podcast too. Thank you so much. And tell us what his name is or his group or band or. Uh, his name is uh, Deverne Williams with the Vintage Soul. And then he also has Deverne with Williams with the sound of uh, Detroit. So he has a number of different things that he does to Donna Summer Show, uh, the Vintage House song, song sing like update songs back to the oldest R&B stuff. And then he has the, um, the sound of Detroit when he does Michael Jackson and Stevie Wonder and everything. And it's, wow. it's, a, it's a very good show. I enjoy being there to see it. Fantastic. Well, we see the fruit doesn't fall too far from the tree. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Stay beautiful inside and out. All right, then. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.